Good evening. I'm Greg Fistad, Provost of the University of Denver, and I'd like to welcome you to Bridges to the Future. As many of you know, the university began the Bridges program right after the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001. From the beginning, our goal with Bridges has been to engage the broader community in reflection and conversation about the most significant topics of the day. We do that by inviting some extraordinary guests to campus, usually three times every year. The first guests we invite to campus are you, our loyal audience members, and you are very loyal. Thank you for coming. Bridges was really created by DU for you. The University of Denver's vision is to be a great private university dedicated to the public good, and we mean that. Bridges is perhaps one of the most important efforts that we have to try to achieve that. Also, when we invite you, you tend to show up, and we're happy about that. <laughs> the second group of guests we invite are our presenters, and we've had some amazing people join us over the years, and tonight, as you will see shortly. Recent Bridges presenters have included Ray Suarez, Anne-Marie Slaughter, Erskine Bowles, Eliza Griswold, Richard Clark, Fawaz Jurgis, Zendaya Fraser, George Mitchell, Parker Palmer, and many others. It's quite a group. As you know, we did not officially have a Bridges event in the fall, but we did have something else. That was the presidential debate on October 3rd, which the university was very proud and excited to host, and which we understand is perhaps one of our most significant efforts to date to serve the public good. At this time, I want to take a moment to thank Chancellor of the University, Robert Kuhn. While many of us at DU reacted with disbelief when he first proposed that we submit an application to host the first debate, he marshaled all of the university's resources and many of those of our friends uh, to make the debate happen, and we think it went off pretty well. Thank you, Bob. This year's Bridges theme, which was chosen by a group of faculty and administrators, is the impact of the 2012 election. We wanted our first event to address foreign policy issues, which were not exactly front and center during the presidential campaign. Joining us tonight is our featured speaker, Martha Raditz, ABC News Chief Global Affairs Correspondent. Before I introduce Ms. Raditz, however, I'd like to introduce our moderator for this evening, Professor Erica Chenoweth. Erica is in the dark uh, for now. <laughs> she is a faculty member at the Corbell School of International Studies. She's probably best this way. I'm going to say some, maybe some uh, embarrassing things about her. Uh, she's an assistant professor at Corbell, associate research, senior researcher at the Peace Research Institute of Oslo, Norway. She does work on non-state groups and their use of violence in the attempt to achieve their goals. This year, Erica won two prizes for her research, for her research that are typically awarded to people many years her senior. And I want to mention those. The first was awarded to Erica and her co-author for their book, Why Civil Resistance Works, The Strategic Logic of Nonviolent Conflict. And that was the Woodrow Wilson Foundation Award given annually by the American Political Science Association for the single best book on government, politics, or international affairs published in the US in the previous year. Typical, <laughs> typical scholars uh, are 30 years into their career. They've published a bunch of stuff. Um, and. Uh, like Henry Kissinger, for instance, in 1958. Uh, this is Erica's first book, and she now has three more under contract. The second prize was the 2013 Graumeyer Award for Ideas Improving World Order, presented annually in recognition of outstanding proposals for creating a more just and peaceful world order. This is a big deal. Previous recipients include Mikhail Gorbachev, Catherine Sicking, Aaron Woldovsky, Samuel Huntington, and, and many others. Thank you for joining us this evening, Erica.
Our speaker this evening is Martha Raditz, a renowned journalist who has covered foreign affairs for many years, reporting from the Pentagon, the State Department, the White House, and conflict areas around the world. Prior to joining ABC News, Ms. Raditz was Pentagon correspondent for NPR between 1993 and 1998, traveling frequently to Europe to cover the war in the former Yugoslavia. She joined ABC News in 1999. For her coverage of the 9-11 attacks in 2001, Ms. Raditz and her colleagues won a Peabody Award and an Emmy. She's won four Emmys. She became ABC's senior national security correspondent in 2004, reporting extensively from Iraq, where she has traveled almost two dozen times. She was ABC's chief White House correspondent for George W. Bush's second term. In 2007, she published a book, The Long Road Home, a story of war and family about the war in Sadr City, Iraq. It appeared on the bestseller list of the New York Times and the Washington Post. She was appointed to her current position in 2008. On October 11th of last year, just eight days after the presidential debate here at DU, Martha Raddatz moderated an, an unusually anticipated vice presidential debate between Vice President Joe Biden and Congressman Paul Ryan at Center College. She firmly, effectively, and systematically drove these two loquacious men, <laughs> one of whom talks loudly, we learned today, actually to answer a range of questions about domestic and foreign policy. A great many of us citizens were in awe of her not being in awe of these two candidates for high office. Please join me in welcoming Martha Raditz to the University of Denver. Thank you so much. And if I get thirsty, I'm just going to grab that water bottle really quickly. <laughs> thank you for having me at the University of Denver, but thank you for coming out. I, I think it is extraordinary when citizens come out to listen to a speech like this. I think it's wonderful that you're engaged. It encourages me. I love it. I also am uncomfortable listening to my own introductions, however. Uh, it sounds pretty impressive, doesn't it? <laughs> but I think back of how, uh, how I got to this point in life, and I think back, and there were several graduate students that we were speaking to earlier today, we, me, um, and Ambassador Hill, he spoke a little bit too. And I was thinking back to once I spoke to graduate students at Johns Hopkins, and a young woman said to me afterwards, she said, Miss Raddatz, how can I follow in your footsteps? And I said, I'm sorry, it's too late for you. You would have had to drop out of college, drink a lot of beer, and play a lot of pool. <laughs> so I took a rather unusual path to get where I am today. And so I, that's terrible advice if there are any students in here, don't do it. <laughs> Believe me, my son talks about it all the time and I'm saying don't get any ideas, it doesn't often work. I'm also gonna start my speech out tonight with something a little different that might surprise you. My Oscar predictions. <laughs> Best actress, Jessica Chastain. Chastain. Best screenplay, Zero Dark Thirty. Best director, Spielberg. Best actor, Daniel Day-Lewis. Best Picture, Lincoln. I bring this up because that's four out of five, and I'm asked tonight to speak about where America is headed. <laughs> so keep in mind those Oscar predictions as I go forward. I have had a fascinating year. I have taken on political coverage. When I was asked to moderate the vice presidential debate, and I remember exactly where I was when I was asked to moderate the vice presidential debate. I was not covering politics anymore. I had not covered the campaign, and I basically couldn't spell budget. So when I got the call, it was a huge surprise. But this year, I have, and since that point, I have immersed myself in politics. I now also have the privilege of filling in for George Stephanopoulos maybe once a month every six weeks when he takes one day off every six weeks. If you've ever watched George Stephanopoulos, it will make you all feel like slackers. It does me, because the man never sleeps. So I have 
and frankly find it pretty interesting, followed the sequester, followed the fiscal cliff, and come to believe that Washington is as divided as ever. If you look ahead at what will happen, and you had the great privilege of having that incredible presidential debate, which is why everybody tuned into the vice presidential debate, I think. I can't remember exactly what happened here, but <laughs> it seemed to be a game changer at the time. Um, so I have become more in tune with politics in Washington. I can't say I love it every day. I, it frustrates me probably as much as people on the Hill and as much as you watching from Denver, Colorado, and everybody else in the country. I think it is incredibly frustrating to watch the two sides. And I think what you're going to see in the coming months is even more digging in of heels. I think with the sequester that will I'd say with absolute certainty, just remember I did choose Daniel Day-Lewis, <laughs> the sequester will take effect this Friday. The, the past few weeks, and this is how Washington works and you probably get it, the news media in particular gets bombarded from both sides. We have been bombarded from the Obama administration about how dire and horrible and everything you can possibly imagine going wrong if this takes place on Friday. The Republicans on the, and some Democrats have said it might not be that bad. I, for one, would like to take a much deeper look at exactly why we can't send one carrier to the Middle East, the most important spot in the world at this time. How those cuts came about, I know they're across the board cuts, but I still think there's a lot of reporting to do on what those cuts would actually do. It seems a pretty terrible way to cut a budget across the board cuts like that that go into effect all in one day. But I think you'll see that happen. I think you'll see a lot more reporting. I think you'll see a lot more people just standing exactly where they were three weeks ago. They'll be standing on Friday, and they'll probably be standing on those sides three weeks from now. But I suspect, as things always happen in Washington, that somehow we'll work them out in two or three months and drive the public crazy in the meantime. So that's pretty much where we are with politics in Washington right now. That is dominating everything we do. There are gun control and there's immigration, I think, on the horizon. And I think probably the president will be paying a lot of attention to immigration for a while, and that would probably be a bit easier to get something through than gun control. As somebody said, until they change the name of that, that's probably not going anywhere. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the debate, because I think what you saw here and it really must have been extraordinary to have the presidential candidates here, was what I saw in Kentucky, which is a little harder to get to than Denver, all right? But it was a wonderful college. Center College was fantastic, and I know you have some graduates of Center College here at the university in the graduate school, so they're way ahead of me. I don't know why I was chosen, but I suspect it's because I wasn't covering politics, because I wasn't covering the campaigns, because I had no stake in anything. And I joke about the budget, but I really hadn't covered the budget. And I, for, see, I have to count on my fingers, two months even. I did nothing but study for those two months. By the time that the debate happened, I felt really confident. I was a wreck and a really horrible person to live with. For a couple of months, my husband, if you want to call him up, we could call him right now and he'd tell you that was true. Uh, but I did nothing but listen to podcasts, listen to books, do whatever I could to get knowledgeable about these topics. My son uh, happens to play Division III football at Kenyon College. So it was fall, and we managed to drive to Kenyon College, which was seven hours. We'd drive on a Friday night, do half, listen to podcasts, podcasts, podcasts about the budget, watch football and drive home and be there by Saturday at midnight and then probably go do this week, the next morning or something like that. But when, the, the thing that was overwhelming to me was how important it was to try to be fair and, and how, I, I, one of the things I was, I was saying a little earlier today is I, I read a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the questions and the reason I did, except for those that were spontaneous, obvious, obviously, 
But I had written them down because it was so important to me to even get the wording correctly. And I think when you're kind of like I'm doing now, you, when you talk conversationally, you may not get the wording exactly as you want it. And particularly on questions like abortion and other real hot button issues, I just felt it was. I'd, I'd spent such a great deal of time and care trying to be fair in the way I ask them and be straight down the line. One of the things that happens is you have to, in your mind, figure out how much time you've given each candidate. They don't tell you. So you're doing this in your mind, okay, I've given, I've given Ryan so much time, I've given Biden so much time, and I had to factor in the fact that Joe Biden was yelling much of the time. So I had to think, okay, he didn't talk longer, he's just a whole lot louder. It's, it's also a fascinating experience, and I certainly read Jim Lehrer's book before, uh, his, called Tension City, which made me tense uh, after reading it, and, and how nervous he got, and everybody else I spoke to, how nervous they got about the debates, that they didn't want to be with their families before because it would distract them, that all, all kinds of preparation went into it, and everyone was shaking and sweating. Well, I found that day my family, family was down there. I loved having my family there. It, so everybody's different and everybody responds differently to these things. But when I took the stage, I felt fine. And I felt fine and I felt in control and I also felt it was out of my control at that point. I thought I'll do the best I can and we'll see how it turns out. We started with a brief thing on C-SPAN and I came out to the audience and, and I wasn't really prepared for this. I, I had to warm up the audience, which is an odd thing, and then you basically, Jim Lair probably did the same thing, and then you sit there with your back to the audience for five or ten minutes feeling like an absolute idiot because you're just sitting there silently. But when I warmed up the audience, I did warn them to turn off their cell phones because I had had the terrible experience of in a White House briefing once having my cell phone go off and my son had programmed in a hip-hop ringtone. <laughs> To, to a tune by, I'm sure you all know, Chameleon Air, um, a song called Riding Dirty, uh, which, which I kept grabbing for. Well, I was telling the audience this because I'm not really a scold. I didn't want to say, turn your cell phones off. I just said, let me just tell you about this, and it's a really bad experience. And apparently, Chameleon Air watches C-SPAN <laughs> because he later tweeted, uh, <laughs> That made my night, Martha Raditz. Keep it gangsta, Martha. <laughs> so that was, I, I just got to pretty much say that was my favorite moment of the vice presidential debate. <laughs> and as you can imagine, it was my son's favorite moment as well because Chameleon Air kept, uh, kept and my son was back and forth with Chameleon Air about that. But once we got into the debate, one of the fascinating things to me, Jim Laird warned that you sometimes miss moments, that you definitely don't know what's going on on stage. And I had no idea Paul Ryan was drinking a lot of water <laughs> until I saw it on Saturday Night Live. <laughs> because I was concentrating on Joe Biden trying to do the math about loudness versus time <laughs> engaged. What I noticed right away is that the debate, as you sit there, and it's very different for a television viewer most of the time. I didn't think this one particularly was. I've never watched it, by the way, but just the pre and I probably never will, but the press coverage of the debate, it was the debate I saw as well, and, and it, it felt very much the same sitting there. One of the things that I did notice is you could tell right away that at times the candidates were surprised at the direction of the debate. I think Joe Biden prepared for a particular debate and thought Paul Ryan would be more aggressive, and I think Paul Ryan knew that he wasn't going to be aggressive and would just play, play off of Joe Biden in a way. So I thought that was interesting because I, I felt like I could really see Biden shift at some point in the debate and tone it down just a little bit, although if you watch Saturday Night Live you would never know that. But I, 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 to the point that I didn't watch it, I had, I had a meeting with um, uh, someone from the Israeli embassy after that, and he was saying to me, you know what Joe Biden told you several weeks ago was not true. And I said, 
what did he tell me? I'm sorry, I can't, I can't even remember. Um, but the preparation that went into that, and I didn't, you know, I thought it went pretty well. I wasn't, I was really happy afterwards when it sounded like it went very well and that it was well received. I was especially gratified because a lot of young people reached out to me, and I like that in so many ways. I like that, and I've sort of fought being the, the I'm a woman, I'm, I can be a mentor, I did it because I'm a woman. I now love that, and I feel like that is a role that I love. I'm more proud of inspiring young people than anything I have ever done. That if young people come up to me and say that I inspired them, that's the greatest thing ever. Um, so I got a lot of great feedback that night from young people, a lot of young women. About two days later, I was in New York, and a young woman came up to me and was so sweet, and she said, oh, it's so great to meet you. I'm so honored to meet you. Um, I thought you did a great job in the vice presidential debate. And I said, it's, it's, great to, it's great to meet you. What's your name? She said, my name is Kate McKinnon. I played you on Saturday Night Live. <laughs> which was another great moment for me. <laughs> she was so sweet, she was also like 40 years younger than me. So it was, it was, she looks, as my daughter said, she looks much better without my hair on. <laughs> so the vice presidential debate, one of the things we did, and we're talking about foreign policy, mostly this evening, is because I cover foreign policy, there was a back and forth about how I dealt with that. And, and I had a wonderful team at ABC, and I got something from everybody I talked to, and I reached back to Charlie Gibson, and he had great ideas, and Diane Sawyer had great ideas, and Gwen Eiffel had great ideas. Everybody had, who had been through this before had, had great ideas. But I, I really needed to bring myself to this, and, and the one person at ABC who said to me, are you crazy? You can't talk about the economy first. You have to talk about it. Plus, Jim Lehrer talked about the economy for about 90 minutes, I think. I mean, most of that debate was about the economy. So I decided I would start with foreign policy and go back and forth. I didn't want to do foreign policy for 45 minutes and then switch to domestic issues. So I sort of switched back and forth, and I'm sure nobody was even aware that I did either of those things. So that, that was important to me. I felt most comfortable talking about foreign policy. I think that, that I noted there was some discussion on the web beforehand about how, oh look, Paul Ryan doesn't know that much about foreign policy, so I'm sure he's studying and Joe Biden will knock it out of the park. But in some senses, I've covered, you know, I've covered Joe Biden for a lot of years, and he knows, I know foreign policy too. So I, I don't think it was necessarily more uncomfortable for either one of them. And they certainly had done their homework as well. Um, so, my experience in foreign policy, and I, I know that we cite numbers all the time, or ABC cites numbers all the time, how many times have I've been to these foreign countries and dozens of times to Iraq and dozens and dozens of times to Pakistan and Afghanistan and Yemen all around the world. But one of the unique perspectives I have had throughout my career is unlike a Richard Engel, who's based in overseas and is a foreign correspondent, I've been based in Washington, D.C. all this time. So having the perspective of seeing how policy is made and then going to see the effects of those policies has given me a perspective that few have had. I, there were a few times, for instance, when I covered the Bush administration that I insisted, I was named White House correspondent, but I insisted on going back to Iraq. I just, felt, I mean, first of all, that was such a major part of the Bush presidency and that war that I made that argument that it was important for me to go. And there were times when I would come back that President Bush would actually have me in the Oval Office to just talk about what I'd seen because as someone who understood the policies in Washington or saw them enacted to then go see what was happening in the war, hopefully I at times gave him a clearer picture. I'm actually proud of the role of the press during that war, after the initial not knowing about weapons of mass destruction. Because as much as we were hearing from the administration and President Bush would later acknowledge that he knew the war was not going well, that I think the press who covered Iraq let 
the public know that it wasn't going well. No matter what you were hearing politically, no matter what you were hearing from some on the Hill, no matter what you were hearing from the White House, we brought that story to people. We showed people that it wasn't going well. And I think eventually it was the public that really changed that war, that really changed the direction of that war, that helped, if you will, President Bush make some decisions, uh, sending more troops in, whatever it took to change the dynamic of that war that eventually happened. So that is, that is something I actually am proud of that we did, and there's not that much that I will leap to the defense of the press anymore, but, but that's one of the things. I think in the coming year, in the coming three years, but particularly this year, and you probably know this already, the biggest challenges to President Obama and to our new secretary, secretaries, well, we don't quite have a new Secretary of Defense yet, but we have a new Secretary of State, John Kerry, will be Syria and Iran. I spent most of last year thinking that Iran would come to a head, that the Israelis would probably go in and try to take out those nuclear sites. So I think a lot of people probably felt the same way. But that seemed to move incrementally, and now here we are this year with a deadline that, if you'll remember, Prime Minister Netanyahu holding up that giant bomb at the UN with a fuse on it, he pretty much drew a red line in the spring or summer. I was just in Israel about 10 days ago and talked to a lot of people on background, a lot of officials on background, about where they are now and how they're feeling about Iran and where they think this will go. I have to factor in the, the, the part that I know some of this is for, for their own message to the U.S., but it seems to me that whatever happens will happen this year. Negotiations are not going well, and the Israelis certainly think, most of them, that that's a delaying tactic anyway on the part of the Iranians. I have only been, only, but not that many people have been there, I suppose, to Iran a couple of times. The first time I went there, and I thought of, we had a reporter there last week. The first time I went there, we shot some tape on the streets of basically their vice squad. And they go out and they check and they see if women have um, their headscarves on. And we shot some video of that and we were arrested. And of all the uncomfortable th things I have done, whether it's in a conflict zone, a war zone, that made me more uncomfortable than anything. Because right now, I can tell you, they, they just held our passports and held us for a couple of days. But when you're in Iran, you think it could be a couple of years. You're not really sure how that will go. So that was my experience in Iran the first time. But I also met a lot of Iranians. And you're always with a fixer. You're always with somebody looking over your shoulder. You always know that there's probably some camera in your hotel room and you want to kind of go, hi. Um, but the people that I met, I remember the first protest I went to over there and it was burning American flags and burning the president in effigy. It, it, it was everything you've seen on TV, the angry faces and the mobs. And I followed a man who turned to me, and he, he literally had like a flaming sign, and he said, where are you from? You know, it says, down with America. Um, America! <laughs> but he turned to me and he said, welcome. <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> I mean, it was, it was one of those incredibly strange moments where you say, thank you very much for that. I'm so happy to be here. But it also said, <laughs> It also, and I will have a welcome, thank you. Um, but it also said so much about what we don't see and how much of everything is theater and how much people are forced into things they don't want to do and how much a threat their lives are under, which ours are not, in cases like that. So seeing that and seeing that bit of humanity for me is always worth the trip. Foreign correspondents are a rare breed anymore. The economic hit on newsrooms is big. There's no question about it. And these foreign trips cost a fortune. I, I read something today in the Washington Post about, and I probably knew this anyway, but to send a correspondent to cover the president 
on a three-day trip might cost $35,000 per person. And a news organization, that's still a lot of money. I have the advantage I can and have not ever been turned down by ABC when I ask to go on a story, when I think a story is important. Somebody's ringtone out there. Oh, it's so boring, that ringtone. Come on. <laughs> it's it's kind of like mine now. <laughs> But I have not been turned down, and I, what I have been trying to track for years is not only conflict, but where I believe conflict may happen. Now this I don't obviously just make up myself. I talk to people a lot. I, I try to figure out where to go and what to see. It doesn't always turn out the way you think it will. I, I, a month or so ago, went to interview Secretary Panetta on what was supposed to be his last overseas trip and we were going to talk about a variety of topics, but the moment I arrived in Rome, the horrible situation in Algeria broke out, so I ended up, I actually didn't go to Algeria because we couldn't, but reported on that for three or four days. So I have been in different countries and reported on the world from wherever I am. I know one of my trips to Afghanistan was when they killed al Awlaki in Yemen, and Anwar al Awlaki in Yemen, and so reported on that from Afghanistan, but I think we probably confirmed that um, far earlier than most. It, it makes me sad to see how little sometimes that Americans are not interested in the world anymore. I don't blame them. We have troubles at home, the economy, our, our own children, our own families, our own lives. But it's why I said at the beginning how grateful I am that there are groups of people all over America who still want to come out who still want to hear about it, who still want to grow and figure out what's going on in the world. So my little part of trying to tell people stories about what's going on in the world, whether it's, I, I actually never reported on the air at ABC, I did it in the web that we were detained for a couple of days in Iran um, because I thought it was more important to spend the time I had on World News or Nightline or whatever I was reporting on, on what was happening in that country. But I think that is a place to watch this year, and Syria is at a point where I think something has to happen there as well. I know Secretary Kerry will probably, and already has, tried to get engaged with Syria as soon as possible. 70,000 people have died. Whatever we've been doing, whatever anybody has been doing, has not really worked. So I would suspect that you see Secretary Kerry and others in the Obama administration try to do something different because there's only so many times you can do something and, and, and think it's going to work and see that it doesn't work, that you don't change course. So I would not be surprised if they start arming or uh, certain groups of the opposition. And I don't know that that will change things dramatically, but I think at least it will probably give the U.S some credibility with other groups and what th with what's going on there now. We also had a reporter in Syria last week, Terry Moran, who was there when a huge car bomb exploded. So it is so much more complicated there than we can even imagine with the various groups. He was in Damascus and there were car bombs going on, off. So you've got the Assad troops, you've got some nasty people setting off car bombs. There are Al-Qaeda affiliated groups in Syria that are surely part of some of these bombings and horrible things that are happening on the other side, on the anti-Assad side as well. So those two countries, I think, more than any, are the ones to watch. I also think in the coming year and years that you will see more drone strikes. And I think, I made the point on the night of the State of the Union that the president came out and said he wanted far more openness about these targeted killings. He wanted the American public to be able to debate and have more transparency on the issue, but he never used the word drone because they still think that word's a secret. So uh, <laughs> the drones, we have had hundreds and hundreds of drone strikes and some of them have been amazingly successful and changed probably the course of history and the course of wars. But I think there are so many that we know nothing about 
we may all say, you may all say, that is the greatest thing that ever happened because it doesn't put our forces, it doesn't put our, force, our forces in danger and that's a great thing. Yes, that's a great thing, but I think the other side would argue, and there's some incredible critics, including General Stan McChrystal, who now, who headed Special Operations Forces, and so had a role in drone strikes in, in Afghanistan, certainly, and Pakistan and other places around the world, who now says, we really need to look at this, it angers people. I've seen people on the streets of Yemen, on the streets of Pakistan. So what you don't want is for an immediate tactical success to be a strategic problem. That if people really have a problem with the drone strikes in there, and Stan McChrystal said, how would we feel if Mexico, which has a terrible drug problem, was going after drug lords just over the border with drones into Texas? We'd be a little concerned about that, I think. So I think that's something that in the next year, the next few years, hopefully the American public will get a chance to debate it. I know that civilian casualties have gone down over the years. I know there's a great deal of care with civilian casualties, but I also know that military-aged males were not counted as civilians for a very long time, even if we had no idea who those military age males were. And the so-called signature strikes, they might know who a high value target is, they might know who some real bad guy is, but they don't necessarily know who's with that real bad guy and who might be killed. Um, the Washington Post recently had a, or the New York Times I guess it was, had a terrific article on a man in Yemen who had spoken out against Al Qaeda and he put his life at great risk with Al-Qaeda for doing that, and he was contacted by some members of Al-Qaeda who said they wanted to come speak to him. And the members of Al-Qaeda happened to be tracked by the U.S., and as soon as the Al-Qaeda members got to this man's house, a, a cleric's house, the drone strike happened. So it took out the Al-Qaeda members, but it also took out the man because they didn't know who the man was because they weren't tracking him. So I think it's fair to debate all of that and something we just have an obligation to do. I think you're also, and particularly in Afghanistan, going to see more special forces used. I think we're going to go back to the original thing that Joe Biden wanted, which is counterterrorism in Afghanistan. When I look, and for me, having covered these wars for so long, it is pretty profound to me to know that the war in Afghanistan is coming to an end. And when I first started covering the Pentagon, we used to, I used to study like crazy. I used to go to lectures at the War College and how, does, how do you know when a war is over? And I think the war in Iraq was over when we said it was and the war in Afghanistan is gonna be over when we say it is. And I think even in the next coming year, I think we'll just draw back more and more and more and more if you've read that President Karzai wants our special forces out of a couple of very dangerous provinces. I think there's going to be more and more of that and we'll just gradually go away. But I should also say that I think we have made a difference there. I think I have seen it up close. I have seen girls back in schools. I've seen schools open. There's a great thing. The sign of a great school in Afghanistan is if all the chairs and desks are on the roof. The first time I saw this was in up near Jalalabad in a very dangerous area. And I walked up to the school and I said, why are all those chairs up on the roof? He said, because we have so many students, we don't have room for them. So they just crowd as many students as they can in those classrooms. My time in Afghanistan, because I have almost always embedded with troops, from the very early days in Afghanistan, from the very early days in Iraq. I've also did a combat mission in an F-15 over Afghanistan about two years ago. And when I think about drones and I think about the difference between being in that F-15, we had three um, ships, as they're called, three fighter jets, because I took the back seat of one and I'm not exactly a really qualified weapon systems officer. Um, we basically shadowed the other two, and 
I, I went up on a couple of different days, and the second day, the French on the ground were calling for rocket-propelled grenades because they had, or they'd been under fire by rocket-propelled grenades, and they were asking our pilots to drop 500-pound bombs. And all this stuff was recorded. I mean, the Air Force took a huge risk taking me up, and they'd never done it before, frankly. They'd never let anybody fly a combat mission over Afghanistan. And I know they were unbelievably nervous, because really, it's combat. Anything can happen. There might be an engagement that they don't want you to see. But this was real, live, the French under fire, and saying, we would like a 500-pun bomb. And these pilots said, we kept circling, and I could see it too. You could see a school. You could see a school near there. And, and they kept saying, we can't do it. We can't do it. We can't do it near a school. Collateral damage, we can't do it. That euphemistic phrase. Um, so they didn't. They strafed, which means the jet just w went down at a very steep angle with machine guns in the tree line where the fire was coming from. And as soon as we went back up again, it's all rather exciting. Um, uh, let me just say that. Um, and, and you can't really believe you're there. Um, what am I doing? I'm too old to be doing this, but I, I'm pretty sure I'm the oldest woman who's ever been in one of those jets, let alone the first one. But it, it, the French again asked for a 500-pound bomb, and the pilots wouldn't do it. And honestly, I don't think it was because I was there. It was so easy to just see how these things work. And this is what I say about being a foreign correspondent. You see it. You don't just it's not journalism by proxy. I see it. I know it. I feel confident to give analysis on things. I mean, when I was growing up as a journalist, it was like you never gave your opinion. I don't feel like I give my opinion, but I do feel qualified to give an analysis, having, having looked at these conflicts for so many years. The thing that worries me most in the coming years are the returning veterans. I have met some of the most extraordinary people. The young people at this university, my son, who's in college, have spent more than half their lives with this country at war. More than half their lives. There was a young woman I know who went to uh, very close family friends who graduated from Princeton in 2007. She went in in 2003, the year the war in Iraq started. There was not a single mention of the war at that commencement, and I suspect that was true of most campuses across the country. But during those four years, more than 4,000 Americans, most of the young people, were killed. More than 5,000 American children lost a parent or a sibling in that war. And now what we're faced with is thousands and thousands and thousands of veterans who have been deployed three, four, five, six, seven, 12 times, if you're special forces, coming home, not being involved in wars. And there is a tribe thing that happens with soldiers, with Marines, with people in battle, with our young men and women, that they feel disconnected with society. We will never be, whatever their opinions about the war, I do not think we will ever be a country that pushes our veterans away. And this will not be Vietnam. But at the same time, there is just an enormous gulf between civilians and the uniformed services, an enormous gulf. My husband happened to go on a bike ride yesterday some 50 mile thing that he's constantly doing. And he said, he stopped at some place and there were a bunch of guys around. He could tell a couple of the guys were in the military and he asked them what they did. And they were um, from the honor guard, meaning they escort returning veterans' bodies to Arlington. But they were both Iraq veterans as well and had lost a lot of friends over there and now were tasked with burying others. And he said, my husband told me he was stunned because the first thing out of these guys' mouths was just profanity about how mad they were at the country for not understanding that this still goes on every day. He said it, it was to the point where it was really uncomfortable. And so he not only saw in these young men their pain, but also certainly traumatic stress, post-traumatic stress. One in five 
of our veterans is going to come home with some sort of, it's estimated, with some sort of mental health issue. And this country is not in any way prepared. I mean, you've seen some of the tragedies that have happened in the last couple of years. The, the young man who accused of killing uh, Chris Kyle, the sniper, had apparently issues with post-traumatic stress. There are so many cases, but I also want to stress that they are all not like that. They are all not victims. They do not like to be seen as victims. There are extraordinary people. I, I think about young men and women I've met more than I care to admit. And the stories, there is a young man named Jay Raffetto who was a Navy medic who lost three limbs about two and a half years ago. And Jay now is the most amazing. I mean, he can text with one hand faster than I can text with two. He gets around, he is gonna get a job. He has an amazing young wife who is getting her degree after taking care of Jay for several years. And the story of them, they married uh, just before Jay went over and when he came back. So they hadn't been buried very long and he comes back and he's a triple amputee. And he, when his wife first saw him and walked into the hospital room, uh, he just looked up her and said, you don't have to stay with me. And she looked him in the eye and said, don't you ever friggin say that again. And she didn't say friggin, she said that other word. And they have been together and stronger and Jay's parents are just magnificent. But I also see year after year the, the toll this has taken. Our, our own Bob Woodruff, uh, who was injured, who was anchor and reporter at ABC News, who was injured in 2006 by a roadside bomb and almost killed. Um, if you don't know his story, he and his wife Lee wrote an amazing, um, an amazing book called In an Instant. And Bob was near death. Doug Vogt, the cameraman, was badly injured. I just saw Doug last week in Los Angeles. He shot an interview for me. But Bob has had a miraculous recovery and started an organization called the Woodruff Family Foundation. And he has raised millions and millions and millions of dollars for wounded veterans. But the veterans who were there starting in 2007, when they started this, are still there. They're still injured. A lot of them are brain damaged and they still have the young spouses who are taking care of them day after day after day or their mothers. There's one young Marine who has a very bad brain injury but is the most remarkable young kid. And his mother will spend the rest of his life taking care of that Marine. So you think that it takes Bob Woodruff and all the other amazing charities out there to supplement for these wounded warriors and it is pretty heartbreaking. So my hope is that we as a nation continue to pay attention to those veterans. Whatever feelings you have about the war, the military is the last that wants to go to war. And it is not the military that sends them. Those are civilian decisions. But they have adapted remarkably well over the years. I think they, they helped us get out of Iraq. They adapted to the changing situation there and they have truly meant so much to this nation and given so much. So, um, yes, thank you. So my challenge, too, is I know the country is really tired of hearing war stories. It's true, and I completely understand that. I really do. I mean, it is hard to tell the same stories over and over. It's hard to tell stories of wounded. There are so many over and over. But if, if I could leave one message about the challenges in the coming years, I would say whatever it is, whether it's you can go to your local, I mean, you've got the Air Force Academy here in Colorado, whatever it is to engage or send a card or do whatever or volunteer to babysit somewhere, whatever you can do, I know they still appreciate greatly and know that you care. So as for me in the next year, and we're going to go to questions in about a minute probably, um, I think my year will be spent a lot in the Mideast. I think as much as we've talked about a pivot to Asia, 
that I don't see that pivot happening anytime soon. Because if you interview officials and you talk about the world hotspots, most of them aren't there except for perhaps North Korea, which is also another problem that I think will, because of the successes of our new young leader in North Korea, I think he'll only be emboldened. And I think that's another place that they've got to take a look and say, what we've been doing right now hasn't worked so well because they continue to test missiles and nuclear weapons. And that becomes more of a problem every day and uh, get North Korea and Iran in cahoots and gosh, endless possibilities there as well. So thank you very much. Thank you for your interest in foreign policy and politics and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks. Thank you, Martha, so much for your illuminating comments. And Isn't I want it great to see her in the light? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We've just come alive. <laughs> I want to thank all of you as well for joining us tonight, and of course the university for putting on this great event. And I actually wanted to start with a, a quick question. You and I were chatting backstage about how many presidents you know or have known over the years, and I think we, we got to either seven or eight. Well, Our have fingers. known, really. I <laughs> You've met. Maybe I've met, yes. Right. You don't, you know, as much as, you don't spend a whole lot of time with the president in any event. I mean, it's, I, I, I've definitely, I'm starting, I met Ford, Carter, everybody after that. My first sort of cl up close and personal with the president was Ronald Reagan, and I was a local TV reporter, and I, I I kind of laugh at these stories now because everybody's criticizing Obama for, oh, he's just talking to local reporters and selling his message that way. I wrote an op-ed when Reagan was president about the very same thing, but I was that local TV reporter <laughs> because they had local reporters into the White House because they felt they could get their message to those areas where they were having trouble and that the local TV reporters wouldn't know as much about the issues. And I remember in my op-ed saying, that I, I was probably not very nice because I was kind of knocking all the local TV reporters and that we were asking them, you know, inane questions and where was Sam Donaldson when we needed him. So this is an age old tactic of bringing in the local yokel reporters who are, by the way, pretty damn good, so. <laughs> Great, do you have any favorite stories about any of the presidents that you like to tell? Um, I, I, the president I spent the most time with, honestly, is George Bush, because I covered the White House. Uh, I, Bush was, a, and still is, I mean, actually, you know, a charming guy. He is, as people say, quite different than he, is in, than he was in public. I think he's, he's a better speaker when he's just with you. I mean, he's, and, and I think probably, um, more engaged than I think people gave him credit for during those years. He, I, I remember like uh, doing an interview with him in Crawford, which was just the most dreadful place to have to go to spend a weekend. <laughs> the press was in some horrible, you know, yeah, give me Hawaii. Uh, <laughs> which I've also never done that, but Crawford was a miserable place to go. But I did an interview with him and you know, they're always surrounded by staff, even those couple of times he had me in the Oval Office. And the, I, I said at the end of the interview, I said, Mr. President, could I spend a few minutes alone with you? And I, I, he looked quite stunned and so did my crew. But we sat down in his office in Crawford for about 15, 20 minutes and he put his boots up on the desk and, and was just sort of talking about his life there at the ranch, and he was talking about Iraq. I mean, we, we talked about Iraq a lot. Um, and there was also a time at the White House where I'd convinced them to let me do 24 hours with George Bush, and he had a bunch of his old friends from Texas for a Christmas party, and that was something to see. That was, that was the good old boy came out in him, boy. And we were up in the residence, and he had, you know, it, it, if, if you're president, you don't make that many new friends. You really don't. And I think people in public life in general, and particularly that, you know, your trust level is so small. So that was fun seeing both um, the president and Mrs. Bush with their old friends from Texas. Um, if, I have not seen much of Obama, but if you followed the gossip before the vice presidential debate, you may have read that he was at 
my wedding. And uh, my former husband was on the Harvard Law Review with President Obama, and like several others on the Law Review, or many others, I don't really remember, it was his part of the guest list, but I joke, I lost custody of him in the divorce. <laughs> so, um, but it, it is, it, it is, it was, you know, it is fascinating to have seen him in, you know, when did they start law school? 88 through 91. I didn't know him in 88, but when they were on the Law Review, I certainly know, but all they did is work. So it wasn't like we were spending great gobs of time. Um, and I, I don't really remember him at the wedding, to tell you the truth. In fact, I tell friends who were there, I'm like, do you know Barack Obama was at the wedding? They're like, you're kidding. So. <laughs> So that, but that was uncomfortable for the vice presidential debate too, by the way. It's just what you need for a distraction because I, I didn't really want to talk about it or have that distraction, but Fair my enough. current husband knows no former presidents. <laughs> I want to go back to one of the issues you brought up. You were talking about the important role of war correspondence and telling the stories about the war and keeping the public informed. And um, I've been really struck by the fact that in the Syrian civil war, you know, at the outset, at least for the first year, no foreign journalists were allowed or are still allowed, although they've made their way in. And uh, we were talking too about Anthony Shadid and your colleague Bob Woodruff and, and many others who, you know, it's been, it's been a tough year for war correspondents um, as well. So my question is, do you think that the Syrian civil war would have played out any differently had journalists been allowed in at the very beginning? I, in this case, I think, you know, I think back about the history of war correspondence. Christiane Amanpour was amazing in Bosnia, and boy, did she, did she help change things. But I think one of the things we have now, thankfully, is cell phone video. And I think there's been coverage of Syria because of that. It's always more powerful if you have a reporter there. Clarissa Ward from CBS has done a phenomenal job getting into Syria. Anthony Shadid. We love Anthony Shadid, who was one of the world's best reporters in conflict. Um, when he would report, we would all listen and we would all follow. I think people are getting in a bit more, but I, I think if not for cell phone video, absolutely, but it's always better to have reporters there. But I, I, you know, I think that's one of those things that it's clear that the world has not wanted to intervene. And you know, if you had somebody standing there night after night after night saying we should, we should, we should, I, 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 and, and I'm not sure <laughs> that you have anybody who would say that, frankly, because it is so murky, because it is so, it is so, it, it is not Libya. And in terms of cell phone coverage and the internet media that's available to people now, do you see this interfering with the role of war correspondence in the future, on, especially on television? I think what citizens can do in conflict, I think what's really hard is for us to verify stuff. I mean, that is always a terrible problem because certainly all sides of any conflict want their story out the way they want it out. And it's very hard to vet that video. I mean, I, we, we seriously will have people like, okay, you lived in Damascus. Can you recognize anything in this video? Can you tell me? I mean, we have aviation experts who come in, and if the opposition says we shot down a Syrian fighter jet, we'll bring in our military aviation people to look at the video. We do whatever we can, but it is not a perfect system. But I also, in, in, in terms of that, I do think there's a limit. Um, the former executive editor of the Washington Post was asked once what he thought of citizen journalists, and he said, I don't know, what do you think of citizen surgeons? So I, I, I not to say our skill is that great, but I, I do think, I do think we have to have a voice in this. We are professionals. So I, I worry about some of that video, but other times it's just, fantastic and tells the story. And, you know, there's a lot of things you really can't fake in that video. You were recently in Israel, and I know you've spent quite a lot of time in Israel. Can you tell us what your latest impressions are or what you saw different this time from previous visits? Uh, it, it's, I, when I hear the administration say they're going to re-engage in the Mideast, I think, oh dear, I've heard that so many times. <laughs> I shouldn't be that way. but. I, I was telling Erica before we came out that 
I, I have spent a lot of time in Israel, and one of the ways for me to track that story and what happens there is in 1988, in the first intifada, when I was actually still in local news in the ABC affiliate in Boston, um, I went over and interviewed uh, Jewish settlers. They happen to be from Boston. Um, Israeli Defense Force captain in Ramallah. Palestinians in the West Bank. Stone throwers, because they were just throwing stones back then with their faces covered. And when I came to ABC, and 12 years later, an intifada broke out again, we went back and found all the same people, and which was complete detective work because I didn't really have any notes left over from my local TV days and my trip to Israel. So we just went by the video alone. And the changes in those people, the, the Jewish settlers who were from Boston went over completely idealistic. They lived right by the Palestinians. They loved the Palestinians. They could be friends and everybody could be friends. 12 years later, not at all. And their position had, they didn't trust the Palestinians, the Palestinians didn't trust them. I find the Palestinians the exact same narrative. It, everyone had hardened their positions. Because if there's anything in conflict that will keep it going, it's as if one side loses people, especially children, that cycle continues and continues and continues. And I happened to see them again um, just on the very quick trip in Israel, they, the um, people from Boston. And I have checked in with them every five, six years, and the Palestinians in Ramallah as well. The, the captain in the IDF, by the way, had, had um, who was this young, handsome, very dynamic, perfect English, uh, had become a very, uh, lived in one of those tiny, tiny settlements that the government keeps kicking them out of, and he, you know, he had gone through a, an unbelievable change. So I think, but, but Israel is also one of those places, it was the first place that I thought, now I get it. When I saw it, I thought, now I get it. I, kn I know why there's a conflict here now. Because you see the geography of that place, you see how small that land is, and you understand that just on a gut level. You mentioned something in your comments uh, that one of our audience members actually submitted a question about. You mentioned how different it was experiencing the population in Iran uh, compared with uh, Iranian state positions and, and hostility toward the West, et cetera. In your travels, have you experienced other places where the population seems so far apart from the government's policy? I feel like almost every place I go, it's, it's, it's different. I, I feel... I think certainly, I, I mean, in Afghanistan, I've just met some amazing, wonderful, wonderful people. Um, Iran, very different. Iraq, um, very different. But I, I have to be truthful there. I did not spend a whole lot of time with the population in Iraq. I was almost entirely with the military when I covered Iraq. Um, the last time I was there, I was out on the streets and walking around near where our bureau was. But um, Pakistan, I think very different that the Pakistanis, I mean, uh, you know, there's even like all of us, right? Would any of us want microphones in our living rooms? Probably not, because we're different people in conversation with our families or friends. So when I bring out a microphone, I'm gonna get different kinds of responses, but it is the spontaneous thing, like the man in Iran, and spontaneous conversations, or if I go out to dinner with young Pakistanis, that you sort of see, there, there's like a mix of pride in their country and you know, we don't want America interfering, but at the same time, I mean, the, the world's pretty westernized in so many ways. Um, but, but I don't want to fall into that trap. Oh, you know, they like Bruce Springsteen or whatever. I mean, that, that sort of doesn't really mean anything on a deeper level, I think. I mean, who doesn't like Bruce Springsteen? Um, who, by the way, performs every year for Bob Woodruff's foundation. Every single year he has performed um, and done an amazing job of raising money. What do you think is going to happen in Afghanistan after the drawdown in 2014? You mentioned more special operations, but what do you think the pathway of the country is? I, I think one of the things we forget is that the, the Afghan security forces are rising up from essentially nothing. It's unlike Iraq that had an army before, that knew how to function as an army. The Afghans, about three or four years ago, I remember going out with the Afghan forces where they were training them 
and the head of the training at the time, a man named Bill Caldwell, I said, so how's it going? He said, well, they can't read, they can't drive, and they can't shoot. But other than that, <laughs> it's, it's going really well. Um, and it's true, like, I think at the time, 89% illiteracy rate, 89%. But y you also have to be reminded that 89% of them are illiterate, but they're not trying to be the US Army. I know this sounds like a, an administration line. Every administration says this, but it's true. I mean, you don't need an army to defeat the US. You need an army to defeat the Taliban or an Al Qaeda. I think my prediction, like Jessica Chastain, is that we'll have about 8,000 US forces there by the end of 2014, and those will be largely sort of overseeing training of the Afghan forces. I, I, there, there's got to be some quick way to get into that country and do missions that are quick and urgent if there's Al Qaeda presence. Uh, but I think, again, you'll see more drone strikes, you'll see more special operations forces, and essentially will be done. And I, I, I really think that's happening sooner rather than later. I think the military, I know the military really wanted to keep troops in there as long as possible for this fighting season this year. But that, after that, you'll see a, a drastic drawdown. And, it, you know, at some point, the country really does have to, have to try and do it themselves. You mentioned during your talk as well that one of the things you're the most proud of about the media is that you told the story about the Iraq war and that it wasn't going well. And you mentioned drone strikes a little bit, and certainly they get a lot of media coverage. What kind of story do you think the press is telling about these drone strikes? Is it going well? Is it not going well? well What's it's the story? It's amazingly hard to tell stories about something you have no information about. <laughs> uh, it's uh, like when we're criti when the media is criticized for weapons of mass destruction, and that we didn't do enough, and why didn't we find out? It's it's awfully hard. In fact, it is harder than ever right now to get anybody to talk about classified material because there are so many investigations going on. And people are very worried about that. So you do not get a lot of information about, um, there, there's a book, um, Tom Schenker, Eric Schmidt, I think called Counter-Strike that has, they got a lot of great information about drone strikes and who makes those decisions. And at one point, and I'm probably still the case, John Brennan, the president, um, at the time, John James Cartwright, who was the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs, really basically became the kill team. I mean, decide, okay, we can do it now, we can't do it now, and the book talks about the fact that if, you know, Cartwright or Brennan would show up late at night, Obama would say, okay, who is it this time? But, y you know, again, you've got to keep in mind the numbers. And if I don't know who, like, 99% of the names are, I, I, I really don't know whether they're mid-level. That's uh, one of the points that General McChrystal made to me the other day was, it looks like we're going after mid-level people. So if we are really, as a country, going to change how we wage war, we need to talk about that. And we need to have more information about that. If we are now, if our battles are becoming remote controlled battles, and that is not to say that I don't think drone pilots are incredibly skilled and have stress to and probably try to take just as much care as possible, but you can't see through buildings, and you can't know everything about that. We can't know now. I mean, we don't know now on special operations raids, but you have eyes on the ground, and I don't think we'll have so many of those in the future. A lot of commentators have recently argued that the United States is on the decline in terms of global influence, and now I'm not going to ask the question that you think I am. <laughs> I'm going to ask, as a journalist, what indicators would you look for to know whether the United States was on decline? On decline in the eyes of the world, um, I, I think you'd look for the obvious indicators. I think you'd talk to world leaders. I think you'd, you'd I, I, I mean, in a way, I, I sort of look at North Korea or Iran and think, boy, if, if none of the threats come through, if, uh, we can't just keep saying, we're going to take action, we're going to take action, we're going to take action. Or Syria. I mean, if, if, if it starts becoming really a part of the dialogue, not only with the leaders, but with the people on the street, I, th I think. But I haven't really seen indications of that, quite honestly. Mm -hmm. 
One of our audience members wanted to know what you make of John Kerry versus Hillary Clinton. And uh, the key question here was uh, what differences you expect to take place as John Kerry as the Secretary of State, in particular with, with regard to women's empowerment issues. I think what, what's going to happen right away is you're going to have less press coverage of John Kerry than you did of Hillary Clinton. And, and I think that's probably just for the obvious reasons that Hillary Clinton was regarded as a world, you know, people, the reaction she got from women was amazing around the world. I went on her first trip overseas. I am not on John Kerry's first trip, although I'm going over in about a week to interview him. But I think there's probably more, less press with John. That's a terrible thing to say, but it's true. And I think the fascination with Hillary Clinton as on the world stage, a first lady, um, then, the then a presidential candidate, then the secretary of state, garnered a lot of press attention. Whether that was fair and whether we should be giving the same amount to John Kerry, I wish we could. I wish we could give the same amount to everybody. I think jo John Kerry will not have a lot of, um, I, I think he will find his own agenda. I think that was something that was very important to Mrs. Clinton, women's issues. I think John Kerry will find what's important to him, but I mean, he certainly has years and years and years of uh, foreign policy experience, and I'm sure has some very strong ideas. But he, like everyone else, is gonna get in there and go, wow, it's much harder than it looks. <laughs> You mentioned that you're skeptical of the so-called pivot to Asia, uh, the, the Obama administration's emphasis on reorienting grand strategy away from the Middle East and, and toward managing China's rise. So are you skeptical that it's happening, or are you skeptical about that policy as something that we should be doing? I, I'm, maybe skeptical is the wrong word, but it's, it's, there was much fanfare about this pivot to China, which was never really explained. So do you think China is a huge threat? Why are we going to move an extra carrier battle group there? So are we going to provoke China? What is the point if that's what we're going to do? And I, I think what, I, what you always see if something is really happening is a lot of chatter about that. And I have not seen a lot of chatter about that at all. I have not seen a lot of policy debates about that within the administration. I don't suspect John Kerry is going to make a huge pivot to China and, and make that his focus. I, I, I don't think you can do that until you've got these absolute burning problems in Iran and Syria taken care of. I don't, I don't see how you say Asia is your number one problem. And, so, and they haven't defined what the problem is, really. Um, we're almost out of time, so I want to ask you two more kind of general questions uh, here at the end. You're a very good moderator. Thank you. Okay. Thank you I'm very much. I'm glad you're doing it. That's a great compliment coming <laughs> from you. Um, the first question is actually, you have here an uh, uh, engaged audience that's very interested in foreign policy. You mentioned that you'd like us to take seriously taking action with regards to uh, the veterans that are coming home. Are there any other issues that you think this audience in particular might take action on that would improve America's foreign policy? Make sure your children and grandchildren read the news. Um, I used to have a, a thing with my daughter and son, and you know, back in the day when we had newspapers all the time, and I said, okay, here's the deal. You just have to read the headlines of all the stories and one entire story on the front page and a couple on the inside, of, just a paragraph. It didn't work that well, but I'm in the news business, so you know they just turned on the TV. But I, I think to me the most, it, it, it really is, I, I, I'm so afraid the next generation will, I mean, I find myself distracted by my iPad. I'm, I'm reading a story, then I think, oh, let me check my email. Let me, you know, let me check those Oscar fashions. What, it, it's, it's, it's so important to put in the minds of your children and grandchildren how the absolute importance of staying engaged as a citizen. And staying engaged as a citizen means knowing what's going on in your country and those countries in which your country is involved. I feel unbelievably strongly about this. It makes me crazy if we get interns who don't know a thing about the world and who are, say they care about the world or say they're really interested in journalism. 
you have to study. You have to look at it every day. You have to be an engaged citizen. So I, I think that's what I feel strongly about. And if we do that, we'll be a better nation. We won't go to war as often. We'll understand what that means. We won't back decisions that aren't good for our nation. We have a voice. And part of a voice as, as a voter is being an educated voter. So here's my last question. As a journalist, you have access to some of the greatest stories before they're ever told. So in your opinion, what are the greatest untold stories in US foreign policy today? I, I don't think you're going to have to ask Chris Hill. <laughs> I think you're going to have to read Ambassador Chris Hill's book. I, you know, I don't know. The greatest story is never told. I, I think probably how much, you know, obviously how much goes beyond, uh, uh, behind closed doors. I mean, there is a lot of probably swearing and back and forth and name calling and dirty deals and all sorts of stuff that we never hear about. If I knew about them, believe me, I'd report them. Um, but, but I do, I, I, I think, you know, when I look out and I, I think you said something about not being, whether it was intimidated or whatever by the pres vice presidential candidates. I have great respect for people like Joe Biden and Paul Ryan who have devoted their lives to public service, whatever you think of them. But I, for some reason, have never been intimidated by that. I do feel it's my job to ask questions. I do feel it's my job to help Americans understand what's going on. I am not a particularly, um, you know, I, I don't, I'm not gonna sit around all night and talk about deep foreign policy issues. I'm a regular human being, I really am. I have lots of interests. I'm a mom, I'm a wife, I'm all that stuff. I like my well-rounded life. I think everyone should have that. But I, I, I do think my job is to ask questions. And trust me, if I knew some great juicy stories, I would try to put them on the news. And I don't mean juicy in that way. I just mean decisions that were made poorly, decisions that were made well, whatever. In that case, we'll make sure to tune in. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much. Water break. Thank you, Martha Raditz. Uh, thank you, Erica Chenoweth. I think uh, we should all commit ourselves to reading at least one newspaper tomorrow morning, please. Um, this was a really good way of kicking off the formal Bridges to the Future uh, program at the university this academic year. Our spring uh, quarter uh, date has been set. It's May 6th. And we will be uh, hosting Olympia Snow, the former Republican senator from Maine. And uh, she has a few things to say about gridlock uh, and many other things. Um, so we would like to see you then. Uh, we will be in touch with you. We've, please visit our website uh, uh, at, the, at the DU homepage. Uh, but uh, thank you very much for coming this evening. I would like to say one, one word of caution. Uh, it has melted and frozen and melted and frozen. We've tried to keep the sidewalks clean, but please be careful when you depart. Thank you so much for coming.